Now let's come to the Lord once again in prayer as we receive the word of God. Father, as we come before you, we pray that your word will implant in us as we know the fact and the reality is that we have been renewed in Christ by the power of the truth and we have been made the first fruit in Christ. And we're now come before you ready to receive your word. So would you open our ears, open our hearts, humbly receive it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now from verses 1 to 18, uh, we have walked through all these 18 verses. And the one clear theme and focus is we have been talked about was patience, endurance and perseverance in trials and also in temptations. We have seen the need for patience in trials. We're taught to think rightly. What is the purpose of trial, trials when we are in trials? What is God's purpose for us? And also, sometimes we are lacking the wisdom. And we all know that we need wisdom to encounter, to deal with trials. But sometimes, for many Christians, we have this kind of behavior. On the one hand, we praise God for His wisdom. And we say that we want to rely on God. But on the one hand, we doubt the truthfulness and the faithfulness and the wisdom of God. So we, on the one hand, we say we believe. And on the one hand, we we are doubtful on God. So that's why we need wisdom to deal with trials. So in trials, James exhorts us, and we need to think about, to think rightly first. And second of all, if we need wisdom, if we are lacking wisdom, pray to God that we can have the wisdom to deal with trials. Now, James also teaches that God does not tempt us. And that's the, um, one of the difficult things that we can perceive in our life. The difference, the difference is that God gives me trial for my good. But trial lead me to maturity. Trial lead me to know the goodness of God. While temptation causes us to sin and fall, the difference between the two is the outcome. One is the good outcome and one is the bad outcome. But our difficulty is how to distinguish trials and temptation. Which one is trials and which one is temptations? Because that's the mystery of our life. And often we fail to distinguish the different shape, trials and temptation. We don't understand why God in His sovereignty, in His wisdom, would allow some things to happen in our life. That's the mystery of our life. But in any case, it's certain that James says that no one forces our will, no one forces us to sin, no one causes us to sin. It is our own desire. It's my problem. It's our problem. It's our sinful desire, sinful nature that caused me to fall, to fall into temptation and caused me to love this, to love that, and the things that are not loved by God. So James says that we sin because of our own desires. We sin because of our own problem. So it is who, it is we who are responsible, not God, because God doesn't tempt us. So I'll try to summarize uh, what we have learned earlier uh, with three points. So seek patiently for the will of God during trials and seek patiently for the heavenly wisdom when we deal with temptation and also escape like Joseph and pray like Jesus and reject temptation with all your steadfast endurance. When you encounter, deal with temptations, deal with it with patience, endurance and pray to God. Receive the power from God. That's the teaching in the Bible as we can see. It's all about patience. It's all about endurance. It's all about perseverance. And so once again, I would like to remind you to keep the theme of patience in mind as we walk through the book of James. So if you have the Bible along with you, let's once again turn to the book of James and chapter 1, verses 19 to 21 again. And we will, and we will read these verses together. So I will read this um, in the ESV versions, James chapter 1, verses 19 to 21. 
And the word of God says this, know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save you. Your souls, which is able to save our souls. So he who have ears to hear, let him hear. Now, following the introduction about patience, James changes the subject in this passage. First of all, James says this: Know this, my beloved brothers, that every one should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. And we know that we should speak slowly. We know that we should slow to speak, and we know that we should be slow to anger. But what? But what does it mean to be, be quick, to listen? Is James saying that we must be the good listener, or is James saying that in general we have to learn to keep our mouth shut and do not talk? Is James teaching us in this passage, as all we know, the counselor teaches, that to be quiet and to be a patient listener in the conversations with the other friends, are we not to be quick to interrupt when somebody speaks? And I don't think that's the point of this passage right here. Now, there's nothing wrong with being a good listener. While we were, while we are in the conversations, it's nothing wrong that we shouldn't interrupt the conversation. But that's not what the passage is about. The focus of this passage is not on people. So, if you have a Bible, now we can just scan through, skim through chapter one. The key word here is the word. W O R D, the word, the key word, and the focus here is the word. Now let's look at verse eighteen, as we have read last week. Verse eighteen, the key word here is the word, the word of truth, the word of truth. And verse twenty-one, as you can see in the verse twenty-one, the implanted word. And as you go down, verse twenty-two, doers of the word. And verse twenty-three, hearers of the word. So the word of God, the word is the theme, the focus in this passage. Now, in the sequence, in this order of this passage, last week we have heard about that we have become the first fruits in Christ with the power of the word of truth. We have been born again. We have been renewed by the word of truth. So, based on this reality, we are a new creation. So, Christians should demonstrate the new creations, the Adam new creations, the behaviors of the new creations, and and we are to receive the word of God with meekness and also to be the doers of the word, because all of the Christian life is to reflect of what we believe. All of the Christian life is to reflect what the word we receive. We believe. What is the word? What exactly is the word? And how does the word direct our life? And where does it come from? How does my life reflect the word? It's because of the word of truth that ref- and that regenerates and renew my life in Christ. So the focus here is on the response, on our response to the word of God, not our response to man to person. It's how our response to the word of God. We hear, we listen, we read matter. The main focus is the word of God. So that's why James says that listen. Be quick to listen. Be quick to listen. When you approach the word of God, be quick to listen. It means you must listen the word of God. Quickly is to take all the opportunity to grab all the opportunity when you deal with the word of God. Take all our opportunity, grabs grabs it when you listen to the word of God. Pursue the opportunity to 
listen to the word of God. So believers strive to listen to the word, desire to read it and study the word of God. Believers will realize that we are now dealing with the word of God. We are now hearing the word of God. So we should listen without delay and with urgency. We should be eager to listen. We should be listen humbly, listen the whole full picture of the truth. So that's why James says that be quick to listen to the word of God. Now, the second manner of facing the word of God is slow to speak. And again, that doesn't mean speak softly. That doesn't mean speak softly. Not in this way. It does not mean that you should speak gently and politely to people. Now, even though we know that to speak politely and gently is the teaching in the Bible, but that's not what the context, um, not what James tried to expound in this context. It doesn't mean that we should speak gently and softly in this context. He means don't be reckless. Don't be hasty to give a speech. He, he means it's about exercise, control over what we hear, and, res- and not responding hastily and without consideration. In other words, never presume and stand up and speak on behalf of God and His Word unless we are prepared to do so. So on the first place, we should be eager to grab every opportunity when we deal with the Word of God. But we should also speak, share, and preach the Word of God carefully, patiently, slowly, thoughtfully, with consideration. So when we deal with the Word of God, we should not preach it, share it recklessly, and nor teach and share in hesitant way until we are ready and fully prepared to speak. Now, obviously, this is the problem in the Jewish, um, Jewish churches in dispersion. That's a real problem. That's a big problem. Because probably a lot of people, they, have, they are uncontrollable in their tongues. They are uncontrollable in their own speech. If you look down to verse 26, you will see the very clear problems in this church. He says, James says this, If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. That's a problem of the speech, the problem of our tongues. Now, what may have happened at that time was that many people were making a lot of noise, were making a lot of position and statement about their views about anything. There were many people who wanted to become the teachers. They wanted to become the pastors in the church, in the synagogues, but they were all liars. Their religions was useless. And again, of all the, one, of all the famous Bible verse, if you turn to James chapter 3, verse 1, that's very clear, and it's clear enough. James says that not many of you should become teachers. That's a problem. And later on in the next 17 verses, it talks about tongue. It talks about our mouth, the speech of us. And they don't have it under control. In chapter 4, we also see there is a quarreling in the church. They quarrel and argue over all everything. Lots of bad languages. And maybe people want to teach, but they didn't have the authority to teach. But still, they want to teach. They are uncontrollable in their tongue, in their speech. So James is saying that the second manner of dealing with the Word of God is you should not speak it recklessly unless you are fully prepared. Be eager to listen to the word of God and don't be in a hurry to share it. Don't be in a hurry to become the teacher. 
And that's James says that be slow to anger. Be slow to anger. And this kind of anger is a human emotion. We all know that we get angry most of the time. And that anger prevailed among the Jewish Christians. Now, be slow to anger is never the same. Never get angry. We all know that our Lord get angry in certain situation. It is the divine righteous wrath, divine righteous anger. Divine righteous anger is found in the Bible. There is the anger in the Bible. An anger associated with the word of God. An anger associated with holiness. When he saw the temple was defiled, our Lord was angry about that. So divine righteous anger comes from the word. But this divine righteous anger, it is a far cry from what James is trying to expound right here. What James is saying here is the anger comes from our deep-rooted rejection of the word of God. The anger comes from us, a deep-rooted rejection when we deal with the word of God. We hate it. We get angry with the word of God. Divine righteous anger does not reject the word of God. And when the Jewish Christians heard the word of God, their hearts were filled with all filthiness, rampant wickedness, evil. And this anger is fundamentally, in this context, derived from their own desire. This anger is heavily polluted by sin, stubbornness, arrogance. When they listen to the word of God, inwardly they have already rejected the word of God. They curse the word of God. They are angry at the word of God. When the preacher, when the teacher are teaching, they get angry with them. So James immediately stopped them from this foolishness. James said, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Your sinful anger, our sinful anger, can never make things right in the sight of God. Anger blots the goal of fostering righteousness. If we want to grow in righteousness, stop fighting the word of God and submit to it. Listen and learn it and submit to it. So this is a very important message for the Catholic Church at that time. And that could be, that can be, a reflection for all of us when we deal with the Word of God. So in other words, to summarize these three things, take all the opportunity to hear the Word and receive it with all your heart. Listen to it attentively. Speak only when we are ready. And don't judge the word of God in foolishness and anger without clearly, patiently, and study and listen to it attentively. That's the teaching of James. Now we can reflect on how, on what is our response when we deal with the word of God. How have we responded to the Word of God? When we open the Bible, are we eager to read it? Are we eager and ready to listen to the Word of God? When we gather on Sunday morning, are we eager to listen to the Word of God to be preached? And how do you think about the Word of God at this moment? Are we all well prepared or are we absent-minded? What is our response to the Word of God? Now, the problem with James' letter to this churches in dispersion is the same problem of many churches nowadays. And we love to judge first. We love to criticize before we understand the whole picture of the truth. Instead of patiently listen to the Word of God and understand the unifying the oneness and the constant teaching in the Bible. So as Proverbs verse, chapter 18, verse 13 says that he who answers without first listening is a fool and disgrace. 
It's a disgrace and foolish arrogance to answer before we hear, before we have heard the word of God or confront it with anger. When a preacher preaches on the issue of sin, many people cover their ears and do not want to listen and curse the preacher in the heart. What a time. What a time. And are we still speaking about the problem of sin in this 21st century? What a time. And how many of us and together and start formulating our own presupposition, formulating our own answer in our mind before we hear the whole questions and the whole message and arrive at a wrong conclusion? And often it is in the middle or at the last word in the message that the whole idea and the truth turns around, the whole situation turns around and makes us realize that the problem is not as simple as we thought it was. So there was a good saying, God gave us two ears and one mouth so that we can learn to listen first. Now, recently, um, Bosco was in prison. That's a big news to all of us. But there, there's another incident has also made a splash in Malaysia. The leader of our Pasatuan Islam, Hadi Awang, made a statement about the necessity to fight corruption in the holistic, comprehensive way. Now, he believes that if corruption is not addressed, is not fit in a comprehensive manner, it will become a common problem in our nation. And I agree with that. And I, I believe that all of us, we agree to fit, to fight, to deal with this corruption issue. We do believe that. But the next sentence is very damaging. Now, he believes that there is a group of people who control and destroy the politics and the economy of this nation. Now, here's what he said. Mala, mereka juga golongan yang paling besar merosakkan politik dan ekonomi negara. Majoritinya daripada kalangan bukan Islam dan bukan bumi putera. Non-Muslim and non-Bumi Putra jadi perosak politik dan ekonomi negara. If non-Muslim and non-Bumi people are the cause and the root of corruptions, we can just, might as well just look at the top countries in the global integrity index, Denmark, Sweden, Finland, Singapore, all of which with the high anti-corruption index are countries with large populations with non-Muslim. So the problem is not about the race. It's our problem. It's a human problem. It's sin. It's our own sinful desire. That's what James teaches. So from this irresponsible statement, I don't really know where he received and how he listened to the teaching from his own field. So when a person doesn't listen carefully, doesn't prepare what he's going to say and speak, and speaks with bias, with angerness, we have only this kind of nonsense. So the Word of God sometimes exposes our assumptions that we don't agree with if we respond based on our own assumptions, instead of understanding the whole clear picture, the teaching of the Bible, you will find that we have overstepped the Word of God, what God wants to say, and even assume that what God did not require for our Christian's life. And that's scary. And that's why we have so many heresy and extremists. People overstep the Word of God. That's the problem. 
When we read the Word of God with our own presupposition and our assumption, we are no longer reading the Word of God. Hearing the Word of God does not only require humbleness, but also patience. Because all kinds of things can prevent us from listening, hearing the Word of God, and that's why we need a lot of patience. We need patiently listen to the whole clear message first before judge and get angry. So don't jump to conclusions. Don't get angry to God's word. Right away, unless we first patiently listen to it. And if I, I think we all must agree in confessing that we are all impatient to listen to the word of God. But God's promise was that he will enable the Jewish Christians to listen to the word of God, to receive the word of God. Because God had regenerated them through the word of truth. As how it is recorded in the word of God in verse 18. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Because of the fact that we have been born again, we have been renewed, we have become the first fruits with the word of truth. And that's why we can listen to the word of God. We are renewed with the implanted word. And through this word of truth, through this word, we will be safe. So sometimes we wonder why some people listen to the word of God and change immediately while the others remain unaffected. Why is it some people with a high level of education do not change when they hear it, while for those who have the lesser educational background change when they hear the word of God? Is it because I am better than this guy? Is it because of his behavior? He has a bad behavior that cause him cannot listen, cannot be changed. Is it because that I have a good listening? Neither. And some people can receive the word of God because God has brought us forth by the word of truth of his own will. That's the will of the Father. His will. He wills some to listen. It's not because there is any good in us, nor are we more knowledgeable than the other person. It is because of the Word of God, the work of regeneration in us by the means of the Word of truth. God has chosen us in Christ, called us in Christ, and regenerates us in Christ, that we are able to repent and turn to Him by faith and able to listen and receive the implanted Word. It's all about the saving Word of God, the saving work of Christ. It is the Word of Truth. So salvation is the past event. Christ accomplished our salvation. In the past, He saved us with the Word of Truth. Salvation is the present reality. When we receive the implanted word, it takes the deep root in us and transforms us. It brings conviction of sin and assurance of mercy. It instills faith and creates new life and we can bear fruit by this implanted word. We are no longer under the dominant of sin. We are safe from sin. And salvation is the future event. The word save us. Because our deliverance from the presence of sin is not complete until Christ returns. So we still have to look forward to the word of truth. Behold the word. Because this word will save us from the presence of sins in the future. So salvation is the past, present and future event. So the word saves us, transforms us, and sustains us. You have been saved, you are being saved, 
and you will be safe. You have been saved through the power of God. You are being kept safe through the power of God. And you will be saved through the power of God. It's all the power of God. It is the power of His Word. So my friends, my brothers and sisters, do you believe in this Word? The important thing is, do you believe the Word of Christ Jesus? Do you believe in Christ? For we're all looking for something that will give us comfort and peace of mind. We long to have peace, but we long constantly longing for temporary things. But the problem is that these things only satisfies us for a short time. But did you know that Christ has claimed himself as I am the bread of life? I am, the I am, the one I am claimed that he is the bread of life. Not only he says that what he speaks is truth, but he is the truth himself. He is the life himself. He is the way. He is the bread of life. Receive the bread of life. You will be full. You will be satisfied. So are you grieving? Come close to him and he will comfort you. Are you crushed by sin? Look at him and behold this word of truth. The wonderful word of truth. He will deliver you from this burden, the dominance of sin. Are you weary? Come to him. Behold his faithfulness. Do you lack patience? Look at this cross. And the glorious cross will give you power and strength. What is the meaning of patience? He will grant you patience in the midst of our life. So come and believe Christ. Come and receive Christ. Come and behold and embrace this Christ. He is the word of truth. So what do we do as Christians? It's crucial to know that we are in Christ right now. And since the word of truth has regenerated us, we need to know that we are in Christ so as a person, as a Christian who are in Christ, we are to put away all the filthiness and the rampant wickedness. Verse 21. Therefore put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. So we pray to God that May God remove our mind, the mind of evil, as we receive and hear the word of God. Remove all the corruptions, moral impurity, inattentions, filthiness, and evil attentions that prevents us from hearing the word so that we can hear the word of God without hindrance. But it's not enough to get rid of all the filth and the evil. It's like having your clothes stained by the pile of mud. And your immediate action must be take off your clothes. But it's not enough to just take off the dirty clothes. Because you cannot go to the wedding or the party naked. You have to put on the clean clothes. Now, in the same way, we don't just have to get rid of all the evil intentions. And we also need to pray to God to make us to receive the meekness, the implanted word. We pray to God that we have the meekness to receive the word. On the one hand, we pray to God that to get rid of all the evil intentions. And on the one hand, we pray to God that we will be able to receive the word with meekness. Why? Because the word of God is able to save our souls. So look, the focus is the word of God. The focus is the word of truth. And since the glorious of this word, the lovely and sweetness of this word, 
is shown and manifest before us. The word of truth saves us. The word of truth is saving us. And the word of truth will save us. So what is our response then? Receive it with meekness. Be quick to listen, be slow to speak, and be slow to anger. That's our response to the word of God. And so since this passage is about our response toward the word of God, brothers and sisters, let us rely on the Lord and make our behavior right toward the word of God and preaching in the godly way. So from this day on, when, and I will quote from the other passage of the Bible, be like Mary, sat at Lord's feet and listen to his teaching. Be like Mary, listen attentively to his teaching. Be like the Christians in Berea, receive the word with all eagerness, examining scriptures daily to see if these things were so, and be like Christ. Humbly listen and submit before the ages to the covenant of redemption instituted within the triumph God for the salvation of the elect, for his own sheep of his own people. And during his earthly ministry, Christ hears and does the will of the Father who sent him. So let's be the hearer of the word. Let's be the hearer of the word of truth. And let's come to the Lord and pray. Father, as we come before you, we give thanks. Your word is, has been manifest before all ages. Your word is like a goal and that we want to cherish it. We want to grab it. And your word has bring us forth and your word has transformed our life. And what a glorious word we have in these ages. And so, Father, I pray, we pray, it is our desire that whenever we encounter with your word, would you grant us power and patience to listen to your word patiently, attentively, before we share before we have any emotions and response toward your word. And let us humbly come to your throne to listen to what you are going to speak from this day onward. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.